Hello there, students. I am Master Pruitt. This is Grandmaster Jim Davis. And now that you've climbed a thousand steps of YouTube to sit at the feet of the Dungeon Masters, our class role-playing series continues, where we teach you the techniques of the monk. Simple question. Simple questions. Why are monks so fucking awesome? Well, they really are, aren't they? I think what's awesome about the monk is that they're this person mm -hmm. in, a, in Dungeons and Dragons world with its dragons and its dungeons and its wizards and all this other stuff. And they're like mastered themselves yes. to such a degree that they've unlocked their inner magical potential. Right. Right. Through study and, and meditation and practice and seclusion from the world. And they emerge from their monastery like perfect body. No poisons affect me. Eventually I won't even age. Right. Right. And my fists will be more deadly than a fucking great axe. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like that's what is awesome about them. Like when they're like, they use their knife hand technique. It's like, this is a better, this is better than a knife. Yeah. In terms of inflicting a wound. And like as you move beyond like say first or second level monks and they start getting more and more of their supernatural abilities and they unlock that inner key and they're performing ma They can even perform magic without the need for practicing spells and, and learning all those things. They just unlock it within them. And that's why I love the monk. And I, I, I just, I come around on them. I didn't always like the monk as an yeah. archetype. It was a little rough in third edition. Well, first off, third edition monks were mad as hell. Multi-attribute dependency. You need like mm -hmm. you needed four good stats. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> basically, and that's tough. And I do sometimes think that monks sometimes suffer from sort of what role do they play in a party. But at the same time, they they they're a mobile striker. They're they're one of those that, that attacks the soft underbelly of your enemy yeah. while your bruisers are dealing with the the other team's bruisers. It took a while um, for me to kind of come around on the monk. I also didn't like them at first because I was like, why is this kung fu guy over here with my knights? Yeah. You know, why why is that? And and when I was really sort of uh, tethered and, and, and committed to sort of traditional European fantasy um, and within a medieval setting, I was like, yeah, a monk doesn't really fit. I, I don't like it. And so I never felt comfortable being like, You're, no one play a monk because right. I, that just felt like a dick move. I struggled to find a place for them in the world. And, mm -hmm. and if a player was playing a monk, I struggled to like find ways to include their shtick in the campaign that I was building. Or sword, or or side. sword, sure, yeah. Or they're uh, they're Sorry. they're throwing stars, uh, they're darts and nine section staffs. What made me kind of come around was a realization that Dungeons and Dragons has not been traditional medieval fantasy in a long time. I mean, they got armor and they got swords, right? And it sort of resembles it's medievalism. Mm -hmm. It's sort of medievalist. <laughs> Yeah. And not really, it's not trying to faithfully recreate these worlds or historical period. It's taking the sort of the trappings of it and planting it on much more modern sensibilities. It was this weird moment for me where I was like, oh, I love Dungeons and Dragons and it's based on medieval history and everything. I should go study medieval history. And the more I learned about medieval history, the more I was like, Dungeons and Dragons is <laughs> fucking not medieval at all. Right. <laughs> Right. And led me to appreciate it for what it is, which yeah. is an amalgamation of, of different tropes. And so it's like, of course, bring that bring that Shaolin guy over here. Bring that Kung Fu guy over here. Let's have him fight next to the guy with the big ass sword and the wizard throwing fireballs and the guy who can turn himself invisible. And yeah, even in our real world history, mm -hmm. are we saying that there never once did someone from Shaolin ever travel west? I mean, it, it ha first off, there's a whole mythology of, of the journey to the West and, and, and that kind of like coming from 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 what we would describe as sort of like the East moving mm -hmm. westwards. And, and there's just all this cross-cultural exchange that when you just get like a, a, a high school level understanding of history, you'd think it never happened. Everybody was in their separate little places. Nobody ever interacted. Yeah. And yet when you look at it, it's like, no, there's interaction all the time. There's people coming from, from one side of the continent to the other and exchanging information and talking. And in a, and in a world like a Dungeons and Dragons setting where there's fantastic modes of travel, yeah. there's ways for people to get 
across hundreds and thousands of miles in the blink of an eye, or to travel on the backs of flying creatures or airships or something, to say like that you can't have diverse cultures and, and traditions in your Dungeons and Dragons world that, that are interacting and intermingling, let alone a monastery right next door yeah. where they're practicing a martial arts tradition, um, it, I think is, 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 is limiting and short-sighted. The story of the monk, which is someone who goes into seclusion trains under a master in a monastery in order to unlock their inner uh, inner potential, really. Mm -hmm. Why not find ways to include that? Why not create a, a bunch of monasteries that have competing martial arts styles? And oh, yeah, you gotta have those masters constantly, uh, constantly challenging you know, each constantly other. Constantly challenging each other. And it's like, oh, this one's got the scroll for the whatever thing, and we've gotta go get it back from them, mm -hmm. and, and, and a rivalry between the monasteries, and like, Oh yeah, every time a, a you know a, a crane monk meets a tiger monk, they have to fight yeah. because the first two uh, of those monks fought and now every time they meet, they have to recreate that ritual combat in order to for I don't know, it's you're the DM. Think of a reason. Well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, cuz every now and again you got to have a Darmok and Jalard at Tanagra. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. You have to have a com coming together. Uh -huh. You uh you 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 speak different languages, mm -hmm. and different mm -hmm. martial arts, uh -huh. but at the end, you come to an agreement and you walk go in your separate and you ways. Go, go separate ways. And you have a greater understanding about yourself <laughs> and the world around you. Let's just kind of like take a step back from Dungeons and Dragons and consider real world martial arts traditions and the extraordinary things that people who are practiced in these uh, in these martial arts can do. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna talk about like the Western martial arts, which are seeing a resurgence and I'm glad for it and I love that and I love seeing dudes in armor fight in traditional sword fighting styles. But I'm talking like the people who are breaking stacks of bricks with their heads and hands and feet and elbows. They're just normal people. They got no magic. That uh, we know of. Thinking about those things and thinking about all the extraordinary feats of physical prowess that people can accomplish without magic. Now you throw all that into a D&D &D world and you add the, the element of the fantastical, you add the element of magic, and you go like, yeah, I bet these people are amazing. Their hands are magical. Right, I mean, their, their fists and feet and head and elbows and all manner of things are magical, and they are able to, depending on what style of monk you are, you're able to transport yourself between shadows. You're able to command the elements without the need for formal spell casting training. Yeah. You're able to do all of these kinds of things. I, I think it's limiting to say like, well, they're just someone who hits things. And I used to be that person. I, you, I, remember, I can remember having arguments with you about it way back in the third edition days. So like, why, are they just gonna hit him to death? And yes, yes, yes. yes. With yes. fists of iron, yes. with, with fists with fist. that break through walls and yeah. snap bones and pierce the scales of mighty beasts. Yeah, when I had my jaw dislocated in Taekwondo, uh -huh. when they snapped it back in place, luckily my sister was there, uh -huh. popped it back in place and everybody got the hell out of the way. <laughs> right. And my instructor was like, yeah, you punched, the, you punched our wave bag, which is about a 200 pound water filled bag, mm -hmm. about 10 feet, about two feet off the ground. Yeah. I'm just a dude that was a black belt at the time. Right. I'm not, you know, I'm not anything great. And that's that's a pretty hard punch. Launching I'll say, 200 pounds. 10 feet. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know. not, that's no slouch. And, I, and that's why I like monks. This person can do extraordinary things, heroic things, mm -hmm. uh, is, is what I like about the monk. If anything, I wish that there were more sort of generic archetypes available for the monk, but open hand covers so many things. That, well, yeah, I mean, op open hand just covers being able to trip and to j manipulate your opponent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. while fighting them. I mean, that do it doesn't have to be, you know, all leg sweeps and whatever. Right, I mean, right. it could be just popping a, a pressure point and they fall over. And they fall over, right. Um, and it could not, maybe you hit them so hard that they fall over. Maybe you just want to be, uh, and we're getting a little ahead here, maybe you just want to be a boxer. Right, right. That is the, the aesthetics of what your monk looks like, is yep. you just know how to punch people. Like yeah. you, you've been in the streets of Kalimsham, uh -huh. in the back alleys, and you learned to fight in the right. fight clubs, which back alley I'm gonna be in trouble because I talked about Did the fight talk clubs about? from Kalimsham. Yeah. They're just so good, and they've taken so many beatings that their bodies now looks at life and goes, oh, you can't even touch you me because I've been through me. so much shit. Right. The things I've seen. We will get to kind of like off 
off-brand uh, yeah. monks here in a minute, but when you're a dungeon master, you've got a player who's who's making a monk. It's it's worth thinking about things like that and working with the player to go like, where did you learn this? Yeah, are it, was your monastery the streets? You're a street urchin monk, and and that's your thing, or did you have a secluded mountaintop monastery? I mean, this is D and D, right? Like, yeah. there's no need to to limit your imagination here. Yeah, let it run wild. And if you've got, say, uh, uh, if, if you're a monk who, let's say you're going with the Way of the Shadow, why isn't your monastery sitting on top of a portal to the Plane of Shadow, if not in the Shadowfell itself? Yeah. Why is it not being instructed by the shadows of former masters who, who have attained such perfection in their martial art that they exist in, t in two dimensions now? <laughs> like, yeah. And just like they've become the stuff of shadow, that's where you learn it from. Your, your, why isn't your elemental monk monastery at the nexus of the inner planes? And, it, and, and just getting there is a pain to begin with. And, and, they, and, and as the, the planes sort of roil around them in their elemental chaos, um, that that it's the job of the monks to contemplate that. Yeah. To to you know to to see tap I, into it. Yeah, I love I love the idea of uh, of studying uh, way of the four elements at like the top of a volcano. Right. Where it's constantly raining and storming, mm -hmm. and the volcano is it never truly erupts. Yeah, but it's always like bubbling. It's always and, bubbling and yeah. churning, but you literally have the confluence of all the elements with the rain and the wind. Mm -hmm. and you're mm -hmm. on the mountain, and there's the fire. And yeah, you 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 learn by by going out and calming yourself. You yeah. know next to the the lake of lava adding those things underground monasteries where uh that are maze like and and filled with you know devices and traps and and just getting there is is a challenge in and of itself those are all the kind of things you can you can add to your monastery to make it more than just like the mountaintop mm -hmm. monastery that you have to climb a thousand steps to get to yeah it's a fantastical place yeah. and why wouldn't you have fantastical locations and fantastical masters who are there? What's it like to learn a martial art from a giant? What's it like to learn a martial art from, say, a, a multi-armed creature? Oh, right. Yeah. Like talk uh, about learning how to do a flurry of blows <laughs> right. And this is the, the opportunity for dungeon masters to in, to introduce uh, unique creatures uh, into their world. Like you know, my master was a, a one-eyed, four-armed, planeswalking warrior who mm -hmm. founded this monastery. Or Let's take Rovian, right? Like well, you're one of your characters who sort of retired to create a monastery, yeah, and to create a place for people. If they could get there, they can train here, mm -hmm. and they can, they can. We can fight each other. We can, we can become better fighters ourselves, better monks, better warriors. Um, but you got to get here first. Yeah, and it's gonna be tough, right? Especially I, the way I, the way I set that shit up, right? It's, it's, it's gonna be really it's gonna tough. Be really tough. <laughs> but now your master is a psychic vampire who, um, you know, is gonna put you through your paces. Yeah. And so, like thinking about those things from a DM perspective, making what does it say about your world that there are these monasteries where martial arts traditions are being practiced? Mm -hmm. What does that mean about your world? Are monks traveling the the, the highways and back roads of your world? Um, you know, putting their ideals and, and, and their orders, uh, tenants into practice. Are there tournaments yeah. that they go to and fight in? Are there rivalries between the schools? It's just something as simple as that. And, and enlisting your players to help you out when creating those things as well. Oh, uh, uh, definitely. I mean, getting a, a Kinsai monk ready for a new game here soon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to go halfling. Yeah, a halfling Kinsai monk. Yeah, and he's going to be like a little Judge Dredd. <laughs> he he went to an island monastery and he had to walk the long walk, which is basically at low tide. You got to walk across mm. this this narrow rock bridge, uh -huh. and you have to do it in the time before the tide comes back in. Yep, you've demonstrated that you can walk the straight the, and narrow the path. Focus and dedication to, to get there. Yeah. yeah, to do that, and then you take the halfling justice out into the world. Yeah, and uh, you know, bring the letter and the. The law and the letter to the people, and I think like thinking like that, thinking that that's where your your your, your monastery is, and 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 not just like giving it like two or three seconds thought and like ah, oh, it's the monastery, here's where it is, and then you move on. It's like 
you can have that and it's a place that the character returns to. Mm -hmm. It's a place that uh, that exists that the dungeon master can then say like, oh, well, your master is dying and has requested you at their deathbed. Your school is under attack yeah. from something and oh, they yeah. need they need others, they need you to come back uh, as soon as possible to, to help face this threat. Or a, a rival school has eclipsed your monastery in power and, and is threatening to wipe them out or something like that. So moving on from like the, the monastery, uh -huh. uh, where you train. Let's let's move to the other some of the other like uh, the stuff in Xanathar's that mm -hmm, we like, mm -hmm. which is second one is is the icon. Like how, like what is the, the the birth of your style? Yeah. Right? So maybe it's like you you could pick a, a, a mundane animal, like crane, tiger, snake, whatever. But you could also be like Manticore style. Emphasizing like the jumps and flying and darts and things like that. Yeah. You could emphasize dragon style, and it and it and you make use of uh, alchemical fire or 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 breathing fire itself as part of your attacks. Um, you know what I mean? Like whether you're doing like potions of fire breath or just like <laughs> swilling some alcohol and blowing a, a, a torch onto uh, to somebody. Those are the kinds of things you can have. There's all these creatures in in a in a in, in the Dungeons Dragons world that you could draw inspiration for fighting styles from and even still fit them within the the existing uh, subclass structure of the monk it's just a matter of how you describe it mm -hmm. and and the kind of attacks you choose to use and the kind of things you choose to use with your actions that will create a sense of style that you have a sense of this martial art is more like this as opposed to that maybe they don't use as many grapples yeah Maybe it's all flurry of blows all the time, and another is more grapples and stuns and yeah. things like that. So, or if you're more of a strength-based monk, you could be like descending mountain style, and it's all just like you know, you learn from some dwarven monks and whatever, and it's right. all about just this is the avalanche, this is the whatever, this uh -huh. is <laughs> mudslide. It's like a giant, uh, a comically large mace or, or maul or warhammer or something. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. That'd be really fun. It's worth thinking about. What is your monastic icon? What creature or force or, or something <laughs> out there is your fighting style based on or it takes inspiration from? Um, and, and, and that will sort of inform the choices you make and how you describe your monk when they attack, how they move, how they approach a fight. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then the last thing, uh, just like we covered in the, in the fighter show, you got a master. You, you got, got a master. master right? You got an instructor. Yeah, and 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 Xanathar's makes the even stronger connection between monks and wizards that that I kind of also see between fighters and wizards. In that, the monk is is someone who studies hard. Perhaps they study from a scroll or a book or or a mural or a set of something that that that, that instructs them in the form and, and and how to strike and how to fight. Maybe it's the master. Right, there's only ever been one master at mm -hmm. this place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's an immortal something or other. Maybe they're dead, maybe it's a ghost, maybe it's just someone who has attained such mastery of themselves that they cannot die. Yeah. It's, it's worth thinking as much about the, the master of you and who instructed you and making them fantastical and, and a part of the D&D world as it is about the monastery itself. Yeah, yeah. Everybody wants to go learn from Pai Mei, but nobody wants to go learn from Pai Mei. We've talked about how monks do some amazing stuff. Is there a limit? Is what, there a limit? What's the limit to, to monks, right? The limit is, uh, obviously there's mechanical limits based on what the class's abilities are. Those are kind of some hard limits that it's difficult to overcome. I think within that though, there's not too much that you would need to limit yourself on. I, I really do think like the, the monk at some point is gonna be punching dragons and giants and whatnot to death. They're gonna be using their iron fists and their mm -hmm. knife hands and their their just inherent deadliness. Yeah. To to take on these larger than life creatures. I don't know how much of a, a a limit there is. I know that that bothers some people. The fact that that's possible bothers some people. My answer to that is the is the answer I gave myself a long time ago, which is just like, mm -hmm. why this one thing? Why yeah. is this the thing that I'm like, yeah, that doesn't work for me, but all this other stuff does. Totally kill a dragon with a dagger. This big, yeah. You know, it. it they, this thing's got teeth bigger than your dagger, but yeah. you're gonna kill it with it. Um, like, that was the moment. An arrow, right? Like a non-dragon slaying arrow should just be like nothing to this thing. It made me realize, like, I had two choices. I could say, yeah, they're never. You're never gonna punch a dragon to death, or you're gonna punch a dragon to death. And which one is the more interesting thing? Which one leads to better adventures? Which one leads to uh, just an interesting game session, and I really do think it's the one that says, that one over there, 
This guy needs armor and a weapon and everything. This one's got spells. That guy's just a guy. Yeah. No, no, no armor, no weapon, no nothing. They've got everything they need right there. Yeah, because uh, if you've never looked up, you should look up videos on, um, it's like called a, like iron bone training. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And that's where like monks uh, will really? take these heavy metal bars and roll them up and down their arms, like right on mm. their bones. Like the opposite of when we go into space and our skeleton no longer has to support our weight. So therefore, what happens? Your body quits producing calcium mm -hmm. to make your bones strong. Yeah, yeah. And your bone loses density because our bodies are constantly constantly changing. being as efficient as possible with its energy production and consumption, right? Yeah, right. Iron bones training is the exact opposite, opposite of that. Of that. Right. You're literally adding weight to it so your bones harden. Yeah. And that's why when you see those videos of guys holding their arms out and people are breaking sticks and the guys aren't even batting an eye, yeah. it's because their bones are so fucking hard right. that they don't know. It's You're not going to break it. It's and not. when they block things with their shins, yeah. your leg kicking their leg is going to break, your, not It's going to break. Leg. Yeah, it's absolutely going to break. Like I said, that's the starting point. That's in the real world. That's, that's the real world. That's like a first or second level monk. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like certainly by third or fourth level, they're past that kind of thing. Knowing that that's what, what real people have done led me to be like, yeah, there's probably not a lot of things that a D&D monk can't do. And that's okay, because they can't time stop. They can't wish. Right? They can't teleport. Well, shadow monks can teleport. Shadow monks can kind of teleport. <laughs> but it's going to take them a long time to match like a teleportation circle type thing. That's the limit. And, and that's always my benchmark for character power is do, can they do anything like ninth level spells? And if the answer is no, then it's fine. That's my benchmark if it's overpowered. And it's just, or if it's over or underpowered. And if they can't do that, then it's probably going to be fine. And it's up to the DM to adjust the, both their expectations and what they're going to do to accommodate. Uh, that character class. But what are some other like off type monks if you don't want to do the Shaolin ball yeah, yeah. with the meditation? Like, right. what's some other ways you can? I like the idea of a wrestler. Yeah. A grappler uh, yeah. for a monk. And I, I know it's difficult, you know, in, in, in fi fifth edition, it's easy to cast the monk as a dex wisdom character. And oh, yeah. Just write it's the it easiest off thing to do. It's the easiest thing to do. But like investing in, in strength and athletics and, and making a character who is good at grappling, combining that with their stunning fist to just make a character where it's like, yeah, we can sick our monk on that guy, on this enemy over here and be fine. And they're gonna lock him down and keep him. And they might even lock him down to the extent where they can move on to another one and take them out of the fight till we're ready to deal with them. And I think I see like a wrestler as something like that, whether you go like the E-Honda sumo wrestler otherwise, uh, or, or something different, or just like, yeah, my guy uh, just wrestles monsters to the ground, right? Of just someone who's like, yeah, I'll, I'll wrestle that that beholder. <laughs> I'm gonna go ta tackle that uh, giant dinosaur or whatever else it is that oh, you've got going on. If you want to fight a beholder, bring a monk. Bring a monk. If you can stun lock a beholder, <laughs> then you're done. You're done. You're done it over. Yeah. Stun. Everybody do your shit. Yeah. Stun. Everybody yeah. do your shit. Yeah, probably right, like done. one or two rounds of that, and you're done. We mentioned like the back alley brawler, the boxer, the pugilist. Using the monk for that, I know there are some great fisticuffs, uh, homebrew classes out there. But like, just consider way of the open, way of the open hand monk, and just reflavor it, retool it. Tell tell us, take take the the style and the mechanics of it, and just wipe the slate clean. And, and come up with something new for it and reskin it. Uh, yeah, because definitely uh, going back to the boxer, I mean, to mention Muhammad Ali again, mm -hmm. I mean, if you've ever, if you've never watched any of his fights, I highly recommend watching either the Thrill in Manila or the Rumble in the Jungle. Yeah. Because you want to see what Flurry of Blows looks like. It's rough. It's brutal. Uh, closing <laughs> closing seconds, I believe, of uh, round number seven in the Thrill in Manila. Uh -huh. I think he throws like... 20 something punches in like 12 seconds. Like, because Muhammad Ali loved doing it. He loved flurries of punches yeah. to close out rounds and to just demoralize his opponent right. going into the break, right? Yeah. yeah. And mess with so, their head. And, and, and on top of that, just the way he could just dodge punches. Like, yeah. he, he wouldn't stay back, even right. though he could because he had a long reach. But he was amazing and just taunting people, getting there and just dodging as they're throwing punches. And he's. Yeah. And he knows how to take a punch. It's all about going with the momentum of the punch, right? Right. And so 
that's one way to just be like, yeah, I'm kind of like that. Like our fighter show where we're sort of talking about real world examples and things. This is one of those things that's great for players of these characters because you can find those videos. Yeah. You can look at those things. You can see what it looks like and let that inform your descriptions of how your character attacks, yeah. what their philosophy of combat is. And, and now you're adding depth and everything. I'm, I'm a big believer that role playing does not stop when initiative is rolled. And there are some people who see that, that it does. Yes. Like, they make this weird dichotomy between role-playing and combat as if they were separate and, and never the two should meet. And, and screw that. When initiatives roll, role-playing continues. Mm -hmm. And it's in your descriptions. It's in the decisions you make for your character in combat. You shouldn't see them as two separate things. You should see them as like, my character is in combat. So I, I've done this with a couple of things. They're not monks, but I'm going to go on a tangent. I had a character who was sort of an arcane trickster, very paranoid, very, very secretive very tight-lipped except in combat which is when it all came flooding out of him right. mm -hmm. and he would he would express himself in in terms of joy and sadness and whatever because the adrenaline was going and and, and he would never admit it to anyone but he liked the fight he yeah. liked the combat there it uh, expressed itself in both like in character banter between rounds which is one of those things where I, I don't like tables where they're like please no talking when it's not your turn it's like come on man like yeah. let's just snap let's just quip it up over here yeah it's, come on it's, it's a fundamental it's a fundamental part of a fight in a movie or a book sure you gotta talk shit to one another. Right, you have to. And encouragement it, and shouting out tactics and... Yeah. Exactly. And to go back to Muhammad Ali, <laughs> that's another thing he did better than anyone. When he fought Sonny Liston that first time when he had come out as, as Muslim and he's like, I'm Muhammad Ali. Yeah. Sonny Liston kept calling him Cassius Clay. Right. And, the, and like, if you've ever seen... You should watch the fight because you can hear him screaming at Sonny Liston, say my name. Bah, bah, hit, say my name. Bah. And he did that the whole time fight until he beat him to the ground that's and the right. whole time he's screaming say my name yeah and that's how you get in your opponent's head that's right? how you get it and, and this is one of those things where I, i'm not a huge pro wrestling fan i'm just it's not my deal yeah but i like how they tell a story through a fight and it it's the same way that you can do with your combats there and monks and fighters and other warrior types other martial types you shouldn't feel like the role playing ends when initiative is rolled mm. and the fists are out and the swords are drawn it, right. it continues yeah always it, yeah it's just like a soap opera with punches final thoughts for monk i have a concept for a monk that i've been working on for kind of years uh -oh. i've never had a chance to really develop it Bring i've it. never played it i want to take the principles of western alchemy the idea that you take lead and turn it into gold, which is a metaphor for taking a person and making them virtuous and sort of like a, a better person. Okay. And applying that concept to the monk. The monk starts as a base metal, a, just a person. Okay. And through and explicitly alchemical means. Maybe they're experimenting with certain substances and things, experimenting on themselves and applying the philosophy of alchemy to themselves. They perfect themselves. Oh. They get a body of perfect health. Their strikes are, are, are precise and, and tremendous. For, for what they can do and and instead of it's, it's sort of a western themed monk taking the mechanics of the monk as they exist in the player's handbook and saying like the kung fu stuff the shaolin stuff that's awesome i love it mm -hmm. i want to try something different and i'm going to draw upon a western tradition of alchemy yeah. which is a, a rich and deep and esoteric and weird and and, and mysterious yeah. and taking those principles and saying like my monk has proceeded through the four stages of transformation. Their soul is gold now. Yeah. And I don't mean to put my hand in front of the camera. Uh, their soul is gold now. They have uh, they have mastered themselves through yeah. this inner journey of perfection and and burning away of the of the of the corruption in them. And now they have emerged as a perfect being. Yeah. That's kind of a concept I've been waiting a long time to try. And it's really like the monk that I've got locked and loaded if I ever have to have a monk. Uh, oh. I just, I'm just waiting for a campaign, really, to, uh, Dude, to try it out. I, I, I absolutely love that idea. <laughs> and, I, and I feel, uh, just as we're coming to the close here, we would be remiss if we did not mention Brotherhood of the Wolf. Sure. Because yeah. you want to talk about a different style of monk, not Eastern. The right. whole thing with this is, this is a guy who's a Native American. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a guy that goes to the New World, who's like a natural philosopher, mm -hmm. finds this Native American, who mm -hmm. they save each other's life and become like blood brothers, basically. Yeah. And he comes back to France with him. And then you have a monk. There they are. Because he, the way he fights, I mean, he's fighting with, -like. with an axe. He's punching, he's kicking, he's flipping around, he's yep. kicking people's asses. You know, he's doing that in... Uh, in, in France, yeah, with uh, while they're hunting a, a mythical beast, a mythical beast. I mean, it's it's about as D and D as you get. It's a great D and D movie. It's Check a great it out. D and D movie. Rewatch it. Rewatch it. It's good stuff. But I could just feel the. You could feel it. I could feel the fans going. Brotherhood of the Wolf. Brotherhood of the Wolf. Yeah, Brotherhood of the Wolf. <laughs> 
Um, so that's the Monk Show. Uh, obviously, uh, we're, we're big fans of Monks over here. Uh, Pruitt, longtime fan, recent convert myself. And uh, there you go. Yeah. Shaolin. So Oh yeah, the Mortal Kombat is a great inspiration for like D and D style monks, oh, yeah. like Street Fighter. I mean, any of those. Any of those. I mean, like you could really just look at Sub Zero and Scorpion as they're both way of the four elements. Yeah, one is ice, one is fire. One's ice, one's fire. Reptile. Reptile is Reptile. all poison. He's 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 the spore monk. Sure, yeah. about the smoke. Uh huh. Shadow monk. Shadow, shadow no, monk. he's yeah. the he, shadow he's monk. The shadow he monk. literally teleports. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's it's all there. Uh, Raiden is another elemental monk. Oh, Blanca is, is Blanca like a like a wrestling grappler? That's it. I would say Blanca is like a different style. Four elements, really. Four elements is, can cover a lot of stuff. It's a shame mechanically. It's leave something to be desired. Yeah. But there's like I think homebrewery.com or like the homebrew Reddit has a really great take on the four elements that that I would use in, in almost every instance. It's like just. They take it, and they clean it up, they add more stuff you can do. And, and yeah, I'm sorry, but the way the four elements should have some kind of one minute concentration thing where your fists are fire. Our fists or fists are fire, or ice, or, ice or, or something. whatever. Like just some basic and elemental damage. Just type some attack. basic elemental damage. Yeah. And then, yes, you can do flares of stuff, sure. Right. But just don't just make it like, oh, I cast Burning Hands. Yeah, right? I, I, kind of, I kind of think it's like most of the four element stuff, it's, uh, it's one key point too expensive. Yep. That everything needs to just be like, shave off one key point. I mean, I, that'd be my quick fix. It's just everything's one point cheaper than it actually is. But yeah, all of Mortal Kombat.